Good afternoon. This is uh, Joe Scholart with AFI Mac. Uh, it's uh, one o'clock shortly thereafter, um, and uh, I appreciate everybody joining for the uh, webinar today uh, on strike preparation and contingency planning. Um, as we walk through, um, the idea of this uh, webinar is to give you a high-level understanding of kind of the uh, areas that you should be concentrating on as it relates to uh, these contingency planning preparation pieces. Um, it would be uh, available, and if you have any questions or you have any uh, information or want to request any information, you'll be able to do so and request that uh, at the end of the presentation as well. So again, I uh, uh, appreciate you uh, joining. And uh, as far as the uh, program today, we'll uh, quickly go over kind of the overview and what the uh, um, objectives are as it relates to the uh, presentation today. Uh, there's going to be five primary uh, areas that we'll concentrate on uh, on touching on today, and those would be uh, preliminary decisions and uh, pre-strike activities. Obviously, that's going to uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, activity revolving around your uh, prepar uh, preparation as it relates to a uh, potential labor dispute. Uh, so we'll touch upon a couple items that you need to make sure that are, are part of that plan. There will only be a very small portion of it, but uh, uh, there's going to be a number of individuals that would be involved from within your organization as the strike plan is developed. Uh, we'll touch upon what to expect during a strike, picket line activity, uh, how we'll go about obtaining injunctive relief and evidence gathering or how that should be done. Uh, some, we'll touch on some precautions for crossing picket lines. Um, depending upon the experience level of the individuals within your organization, some people may have experienced a, a picket line before, others may not. Generally, uh, what we find is, is that uh, in this day and age, fewer individuals have. So this is an extremely important piece of it to, to make sure that uh, your employees and your staff, uh, your non bargaining unit staff understand that you as an organization uh, recognize the anxiety that may come along with that and we want, want to touch upon some things that uh, revolve around crossing picket lines and then obviously uh, we want to uh, touch on not only the security related items that would be covered in the in the uh, last two bullet items but also how you're going to continue to operate if in fact you have decided to operate which generally uh, is um, the plan at some level, uh, whether it's uh, less than 100% or some portion between 50% and 100% operation, uh, how to go about looking at uh, a temporary workforce as well as the logistics piece and management around uh, those individuals that would be coming on board, uh, whether that's support services from somewhere else within your facilities or within your organization or use of an outside third party. So as we look at the preliminary decisions and some of that pre-strike activity, um, this is the planning piece of this is very much a top-down driven process. Uh, it has to be uh, driven by those within the organization, either at a corporate level or at a minimum on a plant level or an individual location level as it relates to uh, how are you going to uh, approach uh, this potential disruption. Um, are you going to continue, uh, continue to operate the facility? Uh, is that going to be reduced production or, uh, or uh, an outright shutdown? And that shutdown uh, determination may be made based upon um, inventory that you already have built up, a scheduled uh, shutdown for maintenance reasons, um, whether it's designed or part of the plan to uh, go dark for a couple weeks uh, due to uh, resource challenges, whatever the case may be. But you really need to identify that uh, up front and, uh, and build your plan around how you're going to continue to operate and fulfill the needs of your customers. You need to take a look at kind of the emotional impact on your employees. Um, as I started out uh, today's discussion, I mentioned that uh, 
most of the time, uh, individuals have never gone through a situation like this. Uh, this is a highly stressful, highly um, emotional time uh, for not only your bargaining unit members, but also the non-bargaining unit employees that would continue and, and re to report to work, to continue to operate and do their normal jobs as well. So you need to recognize that that does have an emotional impact on those, on those uh, individuals and uh, what can you do to help mitigate that impact. Uh, take a look at some of the inventory of raw materials and supplies. Um, making sure that you have a plan in place to have an adequate supply of raw materials and or other supplies that you need to uh, operate your business. And not only on the uh, upfront side as far as your materials to help produce, but also then the finished products and or finished goods that you'd be uh, looking at moving out of the facility as well. Uh, how do you uh, account for the uh, product transportation, distribution, uh, the sales during that time as well. Are you going to continue to, uh, to sell as normal? Are you going to have your sales folks uh, uh, refocused on other areas of the business um, during this time? And then also you need to have some coordination with your vendors and suppliers. Uh, how are you going to, uh, are those individuals going to continue to support you during a labor dispute? What uh, provisions have you taken uh, to ensure that they will, uh, whether that's uh, written agreements or, or oral contracts regarding uh, their ability to come in, or if they've told you that they will not uh, want to support you during this time, uh, time how are you gonna reach out and get an, uh, another supplier in the interim uh, when your current and or long-term suppliers or vendors uh, aren't willing to cross the picket line to continue to support you. Um, how would a labor dispute also impact uh, and uh, the coordination of other locations that may not be impacted by a labor dispute? Uh, is that facility that is experiencing the issue uh, part of the supply chain what it, that feeds other uh, locations as it relates to a production standpoint? Um, would you need to pull resources from those other company locations that would have an impact on them and their ability to do what they need to uh, during this short period of time where you'd be borrowing those resources? And then probably one of the biggest things is communication with your customers and your union. Um, internal customers as well as external customers. And then uh, a lot of people don't realize or actually take into consideration the importance of that communication plan uh, with the union, should there be a, a work stoppage. Um, it's not just at the bargaining table, but a number of other ways uh, that you need to look at communicating, not only with the bargaining unit members, but also uh, their families as well, uh, taking into consideration that uh, there's a number of that would be impacted outside of those employees that you have on your payroll or uh, that work for you. So some of those preliminary uh, decisions uh, revolve around uh, law enforcement and emergency services. Uh, it's important that you reach out to your local law enforcement and or um, emergency response services, whether that be fire, or EMS. Um, make sure that you have some type of plan in place or a meeting with them, let them know what's uh, potentially going to happen. Bring them into the planning process um, prior to an event happening, obviously. Um, now, at what point you do that uh, will somewhat be determined upon your relationship uh, with that uh, agency. Uh, but you should have some type of uh, communications plan and or a meeting scheduled within your, your contingency plan to meet with those individuals to let them know. Just out of courtesy to let them know if you're bringing in additional resources from outside, uh, whether you're bringing in outside support services, um, who that might be. Um, and make sure that you have a plan in place, especially if you're going to have an emergency on the, or some type of event on site. 
how in fact emergency uh, services vehicles would be entering and what the plan would be. Media response is another big piece. Um, you're going to win or lose in the public, uh, court of public opinion. Um, so making sure that you have a, uh, a sound plan as it relates to media response. Uh, the unions have become very adept at making sure that they get sound bites out there that might uh, be beneficial to their cause. Um, so you want to make sure that you have a sound media response and we'll talk a little bit about how that should be done as it relates to uh, the individual who would be doing that, how that would be communicated, when communication should occur, uh, and then also the legal resources. If you need injunctive relief or temporary restraining orders uh, put in, uh, into place, uh, make sure that you have your legal counsel teed up to make sure that we can get documentation to them or any other company that you might be using. Uh, so that they can introduce those to the courts, get in front of uh, judges or magistrates in a timely manner uh, so that those uh, injunctions and uh, restraining orders can be obtained quickly. And then we'll touch upon a little bit about the need for external security uh, during this time as well and what their role should be. So when we talk about security officers, um, Traditional contract security uh, services generally uh, are inadequate during a time of a strike. And when I say inadequate, I mean it from the standpoint of a contract, traditional contract security firm may not, not have the experience level and or those individuals that you would have on a day-to-day -day basis. So you have security on site 24-7 to help uh, with a number of different areas on the facility, whether that's access control, whether that's weighing trucks, whether that's doing uh, tours of the facility, uh, those individuals have a skill set as it relates to that. When it comes to labor disputes, uh, there's a very unique skill set that uh, comes along with that, and generally uh, those uh, traditional contract security firms do not have that. So um, I would... Uh, recommend that you look at going to a specialist, somebody who is experienced in dealing with those, make sure they understand the National Labor Relations Act. Those individuals have, have protected rights during the time they withhold their services, which we'll get into later in the presentation as well. And then the biggest piece of it is it's not about really kind of who wins the picket line, uh, who's got the biggest bat, so to speak. It's really come down to evidence documentation and making sure that there's a safe environment uh, for picket line crossings. And that really is the primary focus of the security team. Documentation, evidence collection, chain of custody, as well as just making sure uh, that it's uh, a safe uh, environment out there for your employees and or visitors who might be coming onto the, onto the property. You want to make sure that you have a map of the entire facility. If you haven't had a survey done or an engineering company come out recently and, and perform an assessment or an audit of the facility, it's a good, uh, good opportunity uh, to uh, do that, uh, making sure that you understand uh, where all your property lines are, any easements that might be in effect, um, signs and fencing of the property. Uh, if you don't have fencing, uh, maybe look at uh, putting up or erecting fence that uh, would help control uh, access to the property as well, and signage. If you do have fencing, make sure that you do an assessment to make uh, to ensure that, in fact, there aren't any weak areas of the fence. Uh, there aren't areas uh, that might be falling down. Uh, there might be holes cut in the fence already. You may want to look at... Um, and, and area five feet on either side to make sure that there's no brush or any uh, property that might be there that would help gain access over that fence. Lighting is still the best and cheapest form of security, always will be. Um, so I, you'll see in the presentation here that there is uh, an example of a, a portable light tree. You don't have enough lighting uh, and you need to add lighting. This is a very effective way to do that. 
you bring additional affordable lighting in, though, you need to make sure on where you locate that. Um, if you're adjacent to public roadways, uh, you don't want to put it in a position or position it in a way that it obstructs the vision of that roadway or the drivers on that roadway, as well as individuals that are coming into the facility. But uh, without a doubt, additional lighting is always a good thing to put up. Just uh, prohibits people and really uh, makes them think twice about uh, doing something that uh, they know they probably shouldn't be doing uh, if, it, if they can be easily seen. Generally, you're going to do some type of modified security patrol as well, uh, whether that's your uh, regular uh, contract security firm or an outside expert on the security as it relates to the strike. Um, you're going to want to make sure you're looking at mission critical areas. And when I say mission critical, those items that might be disruptive or if there's a, a, a interruption uh, of that service, uh, i.e. utility, uh, communication, things of that nature, uh, that would uh, temporarily uh, create a problem for your organization. You want to make sure that you're doing some additional security patrols in that area. And then secure all access points. Uh, you may have a number of ingress and egress uh, points within your facility or on your property. Uh, look at maybe reducing those uh, and reducing the number of those uh, to help control uh, and not have to worry about covering so much space as it relates from a security perspective. Uh, and then off-site parking, uh, one of the biggest areas where people kind of miss on their on their contingency plans we've seen is is that um, they don't take into consideration two big things transportation of individuals that would be coming onto the property as well as adequate parking so if you need an off-site parking because you your employees don't want to drive their personal vehicles across the picket line uh, you, you make that decision from a safety standpoint or uh, you don't have a, a provision in place to take care of your employees if there's strike-related da damage to their own vehicles. You may want to look at securing an off-site parking uh, area that's well-lit, fenced, controlled. Uh, don't use a public access uh, spot for that off-site parking area. It doesn't do you a lot of good. Uh, and uh, if you want to have security on that, if, especially if you're using a public, a public access, uh, then you're kind of not spending your money uh, wisely, and uh, um, you really need to make sure that you have that space that's controlled and you can control who comes in and out of that facility as well. Data communication and uh, data and communication lines, as I mentioned when I was going over the security patrols, it's an important piece. The union is not going to want to do anything that's going to disrupt you on a long term basis. They want to cause you some short yet um, effective um, disruption of some type. Data and communication is a good way to do that. Um, it'll help uh, uh, help you to make sure that you understand how that data and communications line come in. Are they above ground, below ground? Um, are there multiple entry points? What happens? Do you have any redundancy built into your system for those data and communication lines? Uh, protection of vital assets and utility feeds is another one. So that utility, just as data and communication, utility feeds, water, electricity, things of that nature that would disrupt you uh, should someone want to sabotage something of that nature. Then make sure that you do some type of fire uh, suppression system check prior to a labor dispute as well. Uh, make sure that you're doing that. There's usually an annual check that's required anyway whether that's a wet system or a dry system or some type of special chemical system that you have, make sure that that's done. Even if you've, you've done it within the past eight months, wouldn't be a, uh, a bad plan to bring somebody in to do a recheck of that so that that's one thing you don't have to worry about. There's a number of issues that you're going to be dealing with. So making sure that you have a safe environment uh, should be high on the list. And if you can get that done and out of the way, that's one less thing that you have to be concerned about as well as the key control and access control system. Um, make sure that you disengage or you um, actually um, turn off key cards uh, that employees might have so that they can't control that. Not only access control, but 
really look at and get with your IT department as it relates to individuals who might be able to remote in. Uh, generally, this is a lot of a lot of a lot of times you'll find that uh, maintenance and or maintenance personnel or operations people uh, might have the ability to log in to look at systems uh, to check. They can do uh, some remote uh, uh, diagnosis and or do some remote repairs as a result. So uh, not only when you're looking at key control and access control, but you need to look at the, from the IT standpoint on who can gain access to your server or systems within that. Establish at command post. This is important because it really needs to be a, a, an area where those decision makers can can either be housed or go to to help in the uh, the planning as well as the execution of your plan. Um, it should be the center of communications uh, from an evidence processing and storage standpoint. Your security team should be located there. Any of those reports or evidence that's gathered should uh, be housed, uh, not only received, processed, but also housed at that uh, uh, command post as well. Your decision makers from your organization should be there as well. It's going to be a very fluid, fast-moving scenario, so things may have to change quickly, so it's good to have everybody in one central location. Uh, make a adaptations to the perimeter of the property. I mentioned before, fence lines, things of that nat nature, either putting up some type of barrier or making sure that it's in good uh, and not in need of repair. Uh, and establish and uh, assure that there's integrity of a reserve or a contractor gate. Uh, you may want to touch base with your legal team. Uh, we don't profess, nor do I profess to be, a, uh, to be an attorney, but you need to look at the integrity of any contractor gates. Uh, a lot of people have misconceptions about what qualifies as a contractor gate, who can use that, uh, at what point do they paint that gate and then allow the uh, union to legally picket that as well and then create a problem for if you have suppliers or vendors who don't want to cross a picket line and can use a contractor gate, uh, all of a sudden you've got picketers there as a result of uh, not handling that uh, that gate properly or that entrance properly, and then you've got yourself in another situation where you're not BMO able to get supplies and or resources in that are critical to the operation. Take a look at your current security camera coverage and limitations on adaptations to that. So you wanna look at the current coverage that you have, how you do that, and then when I make mention of limitations on adaptations, you don't want to change your camera coverage and or your overall um, surveillance program as it relates to a, an approaching uh, expiring collective bargaining agreement. Um, if you don't have a system, you can't look at putting one in just before a potential labor dispute. Um, you're gonna to wanna to check with your legal department on that too. If you have a plan to upgrade and change things from an existing plan, uh, make sure that you can well, uh, that's well documented and you can sh easily show that that was part of a capital improvement uh, process uh, prior to a labor dispute. Because what that'll get into, and we talk and a little bit later, I'll talk about uh, protected and concerned concerted activity and what uh, the union can and cannot do. You don't want to do something that's going to create what they term a chilling effect uh, that would create an opportunity for the union to file an unfair labor practice charge. And then your on-site communication and coordinate communication with all entities, not only there and locally within the community, but if you have other facilities that you uh, communicate with on a regular basis, make sure that you have uh, a, a system to do that. If something's interrupted, how are you gonna communicate not only to your staff there locally and the community, uh, but to other uh, locations and or uh, corporate staff. From a preparation standpoint too, you need to look at making sure that you have uh, spare parts for any vehicles, trucks, uh, mobile equipment, 
things of that nature so that you have that on hand and you're not in a position where you have to wait for uh, parts that might be difficult to get or difficult to get into the facility uh, as a result of the picket line. Uh, vehicle glass and repair, as well as um, tire repair. Um, you should reach out and make sure you have a mobile unit on, uh, on standby, so to speak, to come out and make those repairs to vehicles, whether that's glass and or tires. And then look at the, any special barriers or protection of equipment. I talked a little bit about in those mission critical areas. Uh, you may have a uh, some type of uh, area within the facility that's critical to your operation that you need additional protection around. That protection could be empty dry uh, trailers that you bring in to put up around the facility or, or that area. Uh, the concrete barriers that you may want to bring in to help control uh, or uh, take care of traffic flow. Um, traffic redirection or, or gate closures as a result of that. And then those uh, IT considerations that I mentioned before as far as your computer services, remote access, uh, looking, uh, making sure that you, your, uh, uh, your cybersecurity plan is up to speed on hacking. You need uh, some digital forensics done, making sure that you have a group on hand or in place to take a look at that if, in fact, you are um, uh, breached in any way uh, via, via some type of cybersecurity attack. So I talked a little bit a few minutes ago about protected and unprotected activity. Um, so the current, uh, the, neighbor, the, the National Labor Relations Act uh, is really designed to protect employees and their, employ and their right to strike and to engage in other what they term as concerted activity for mutual aid and protection. So an employer cannot discipline or retaliate against employees who are engaged in such protected conduct. So if they're, um, if they're engaging in activity that would be considered under the, the, the act as protected activity, that can be anywhere about meeting with union leadership, doing some uh, um, hand billing as it relates to passing out information, having meetings, things of that nature. Uh, you really can't uh, retaliate against those, indivi those individuals. However, the National Labor Relations Act does not protect employees who engage in conduct that is either violent, threatening, or illegal. So during a, a picket line and that activity, I mentioned men uh, emotions or intentions generally run very high. Uh, people will act out of character. You may, may have known them for a number of years and would never think that they'd do anything and then all of a sudden you kind of see them uh, act in a way that is kind of a, a shock to you um, that sh shouldn't be, quite honestly, um, depending upon how contentious the uh, negotiations are and or the contract that's being negotiated, uh, you may find that individuals uh, can act out of character. You might be harassed verbally as you cross the picket line or depending upon your involvement with the negotiations and it may, it may even extend to your home. There will probably be attempts to persuade you not to cross the picket line, which obviously you have an obligation to, to report to work based upon your current uh, status with the organization and not being part of that collective bargaining unit. Um, and there will, it says may, but there will be media present at some point, whether that's uh, at the start of the, uh, the strike or if it's a, a protracted event or something that goes on for some, quite some time, uh, the media may come out on a, uh, uh, you know, to uh, see what's happening with negotiations. They might be called out uh, by the union members uh, to get them some exposure. So it's not whether it's may uh, media be present, they will be at some point. And then uh, the individuals who are withholding their services are generally going to have some type of uh, video equipment as well. Uh, from a security perspective and making sure that illegal picketing activity is captured and documented, uh, the security team will generally have some type of security uh, equipment, or I'm sorry, video equipment as well. Uh, and the picketers will, uh, and the union members will as well. 
uh, they're trying to use it uh, in the same manner uh, to show that uh, the uh, security team is being aggressive or the company's doing something that's uh, not appropriate. So uh, understand that that's a, a high degree of likelihood as well. And then don't be surprised if uh, false statements uh, are made and that's an attempt to injure the company's relations with their customers, their suppliers, their reputation, things of that nature. Depending upon what state you're in as well, um, picketers uh, generally will uh, hold uh, signage and kind of walk uh, in lines as it relates to the, uh, getting their message out. Um, there are blocking uh, regulations as it relates to how if in fact they can block uh, individuals from either entering or exiting the property. Uh, there are states uh, that have certain laws as it relates to allowing uh, some level of, of blocking to occur. Uh, it may be 20 seconds, it may be 30 seconds, it may be a minute. There may be some states that don't allow that at all. So you need to check with your legal team as well and do the research as it relates to what you might be able to expect if in fact you have people that are either entering or exiting the facility and uh, if in fact the uh, picketers are allowed to hold them up in any way. Um, you have to be prepared for mass picketing. Um, generally, you're gonna have a certain number of individuals who are on the picket line. Uh, it, that may be controlled by a, uh, an injunction that's uh, released by the courts. Uh, that governs the number of picketers that can be on the picket line, uh, but there may be situations where you don't have that in place and you have to be concerned about mass picketing. Uh, one of the things and the potential that might be there with mass picketing as well is if you start to see individuals that you do not recognize, uh, that would be the time to kind of engage another level of or heighten your awareness of what's going on because what's happened is, is you've had either some type of uh, an uh, activist group, another union that has uh, come out to demonstrate or to actually show support uh, for those individuals who are on strike. Those individuals do not have a vested interest in your business, like the strike, uh, like your uh, bargaining unit members who are on strike, and therefore uh, they may not have the same uh, mindset and or uh, act the same way on the picket line. So if you start seeing faces that you don't recognize, you need to heighten your awareness of what's going on, especially out on the picket line when that occurs. Um, as I mentioned, potential obstruction of the entrance and then any trespassing on, on private property. Uh, how are you going to handle that? Are you gonna immediately call local law enforcement? Are you gonna file charges against those individuals for uh, coming on the private property, uh, as well as other illegal picketing activity. How are you going to, as a company going to handle that? So what is forbidden on the picket line and what conduct is considered that? Intimidation, coercion, or threatening uh, activity, whether that's uh, through actions and or words that are said to individuals who would be crossing the picket line. Uh, any damage to property. Uh, is for, uh, forbidden on the picket line as well. You'll see a number of ways uh, on this slide that they can do that. Uh, an example would be cutting uh, brake lines on a tractor trailer, um, whether that's use of projectiles from a slingshot, throwing down uh, what are uh, uh, lovingly called uh, jack rocks, so to speak, uh, from the standpoint of puncturing tires uh, and that's why I mentioned that the, you need to make sure you have that service on, on board for those types of things. But that's all illegal picketing activity that the security detail should be looking at capturing and getting to your legal department to help get that uh, injunctive relief or a restraining order of some type. Uh, interference with those vehicles by blocking, dropping nails, glass, threatening violence, physical violence, um, obscenities and decency, disturbing the peace. Those are all illegal activity uh, that hopefully will be captured and you can use that. Um, as I mentioned before, 
you as an organization, whether that's through senior management and or your HR department and leaders there, need to determine exactly if in fact you have an individual or an employee who engages in this type of activity, uh, what are you going to do about it uh, when the uh, labor dispute comes to an end? Um, are you gonna take any type of disciplinary action, whether that can range anywhere from uh, a write-up or discussion in their personnel file, some type of uh, um, suspension, so to speak, and or to the point of termination of their employment as a result of that. So we want to gather evidence, submit it to your legal team, get that assistance from local law enforcement. Um, picketing is, is, if peaceful, is legal, as, and uh, the police aren't going to do much about that as long as they're not doing something illegal. The, the amount of law enforcement assistance you're going to receive uh, may be impacted by a lot of different things. They have sympathy for the strikers. They're a unionized group themselves. They have a shortage of manpower. Um, you're governed by a, uh, an, uh, a law enforcement official that might be an elected position. Um, so when you're looking at local law enforcement, uh, you need to look at kind of what's your relationship been like, what's their response been or response time been like in the past for you, as well as understand exactly kind of what their role is going to be. Safety issues will always be responded to, and then any item that might be enforceable by the courts, uh, the law enforcement is going to respond to. So. You can get a wide array of legal uh, or law enforcement response or participation, depending upon those scenarios, from uh, a high degree of support and response to uh, negligible or, quite honestly, none at all. So, in, in obtaining an injunction or um, and the, the purpose of gathering evidence really is a deterrent value is of deterrent value and it, it you really need to obtain and enforce state court injunctions through this continued effort not only the evidence collection and evidence gathering in helps of obtaining an initial uh, injunction but also the continued support of that temporary restraining order and or injunctive relief uh, defending against and prosecuting unfair labor practice charges that might be filed against you as well. Um, not many companies do realize this, but actually you can go back and sue the union for damages related to illegal strike activity. Uh, and that would be something you'd want to talk to your legal team about as well. Uh, that would have a huge impact, obviously, on the union from a financial standpoint, if you can go back and uh, and document that uh, um, they created some type of uh, financial harm to you as a result of that illegal activity. And then, as I mentioned earlier, about disciplining strikers on the picket line for their misconduct. So how do, how do companies go about gathering this evidence? Generally, it's with facility cameras, whether that's your system that you already have in place, mobile videotaping or capabilities and audio, depending upon the state that you're in, uh, it uh, will determine, in fact, if you use audio or not. Generally, as, a, as an organization, we recommend that we turn the audio off. Uh, that way, there's no, no issue, but you may want to be uh, in a position where you have audio captured if you're not in a two-party consent state. Uh, picket line logs and other do documentation, any activity, illegal activity, any incidents that occur, incident reports would be written funneled up and, and would be part of that uh, uh, evidence that would be introduced to help get that injunctive relief. And then any physical evidence would be gathered, cataloged, um, and stored properly so that there isn't an issue with uh, violation of chain of custody so that if it's introduced as evidence in the courts, it doesn't become inadmissible because of a chain of custody um, violation. As I mentioned, use of uh, facility cameras and videotape, uh, the uh, National Labor Relations 
board itself presumes that pickets are going to be lawful and peaceful. That's the assumption that they start with. Um, it also generally forbids surveillance of picket line activity. So you can't constantly videotape peaceful uh, picketing um, to the point where it gets you to the level of it's appearing that you're surveilling the union during this peace, peaceful picketing. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, it gives that chilling effect on the picketing activity, which then the union can use as, as part of the uh, argument that's going uh, if they want to follow an unfair labor practice charge. So um, what you can do is film activity on the picket line. So individuals crossing the picket line, trucks coming in and out, but you can't just continually monitor or surveil a peaceful picketing a picket line. Um, because that will uh, create uh, some headache for you as it relates to an unfair labor practice charge. Uh, if you have that existing network of security cameras, it's okay for the company to, to observe, continue observing areas that those cameras already uh, observe, whether that's a static camera or it has pan, tilt, and zoom capability, as long as you don't modify things so that they're looking at areas that you generally don't look at, uh, you're going to be in a, in a positive uh, situation. Uh, don't refocus any of those cameras on there. So it looks at a, a back gate and all of a sudden you're, that, that camera is now turned to look at the front gate. Um, there's uh, there's got to be a reason for that and a well-documented reason for doing that. Um, you can't really enhance the number of cameras or their capabilities, as I mentioned, unless you can show that it was part of, of a, uh, uh, an improvement plan, your overall security improvement plan prior to either the strike or actually even going into negotiations. Uh, you should meet with your legal team to determine exactly what timeline that would be, whether that's four months ahead of contract negotiation, six months, you know, be sensitive to any changes that you're making if it's a, a year uh, that you're uh, negotiating a new contract. Uh, the company can have security uh, personnel uh, with video capabilities posted at or near the entrance, as I mentioned, when that activity, when either illegal picketing activity is observed or there's some crossing of the picket line, the security officers can then video, as you can see in these uh, graphics here, that the security officer is holding the camera. Uh, there's nothing happening going on, but someone comes across the picket line or they see some type of illegal picketing, that's when they would start to film. So when you're looking at that, make sure that you have coverage, the security personnel and or uh, video coverage that allows you to see all areas of the, that entrance. So this diagram here talks a little bit about being able to position so that if a truck's coming in onto the property, you've got picketers there, you've got coverage on both sides of that truck because on one side, there may not be any activity, but as you can see, by those individuals that are uh, indicated by uh, in the red there, they might be doing some type of misconduct of some type. And if you only have the one set of security on the one side, you're going to uh, create the opportunity to miss or um, capture any illegal picketing and or misconduct. Incidents of violence and property damage should be recorded immediately uh, and uh, documented. And if need be, um, local law enforcement contacted, uh, notify at least the, those individuals who are in the command post and control the message that might be going out or coming in from that. A specific re report uh, that indicates the nature of the incident, the date, the times, the n names of those individuals who are involved, any witnesses uh, to the action as well should be included on those incident reports. So let's talk a little bit about precautions for crossing that picket line. Uh, so your employees aren't very familiar with what happens during a strike. They aren't quite sure how to, uh, how to go about doing that. Uh, you need to look at, at doing some type of educational session with them on what to expect and how to uh, go about crossing a picket line. Some very general common sense things that come into play here. 
uh, but are often forgotten. Uh, you need to instruct those individuals to always remain calm, composed, and act professional. Um, they should never risk their safety or your safety or that of someone who's on the picket line. Um, always be patient and apply common sense as it relates to that. Try to ignore the picket line name calling. Don't engage in conversation or or respond to those uh, uh, verbal verbal cues that you might be getting. And then pay attention to what's going on around you. Um, make sure that your kind of head's on a swivel as it relates to what's happening around you, where someone might be trying to gain your attention on one side and something being done on uh, on the other side of your, your vehicle. Uh, as you're coming in. So make sure that you uh, just are aware of your surroundings at all times. Keep your doors and windows, uh, doors locked and windows up. Um, can't imagine how many times I've heard stories of individuals either putting down their windows or actually even getting out of their vehicles. Um, it's uh, highly recommend that you don't do that and just stay within the vehicle. And don't make gestures or display signs that might provoke some type of illicit response from the picketers. Um, so you don't want to get into a situation where you're making a gesture, holding up some type of sign, you know, putting your paycheck up against the window, things of that nature that would uh, create some type of uh, negative response. If you do have people that are crossing the picket line, it's always a good idea to have, uh, have them come in carpools. And that really helps to reduce the number of uh, line crossings that occur. Um, and at least initially, uh, when a strike starts, it's really recommended that uh, people come in those carpools and avoid that crossing a picket line alone. Um, they help reduce the, the volume of traffic, as I mentioned. Uh, they also actually have built-in witnesses as a result. So you've got a number of eyes that are coming across uh, in one uh, vehicle, uh, and that uh, creates the opportunity to have additional witnesses should something happen can be anywhere from carpools or on, on individuals coming in in vehicles, or you get into a larger vehicle like a bus or a shuttle bus of some type that might be an option to uh, bring those employees across. Don't ever let your spouse or a family member bring you to work or drive anything, uh, drive an individual to work. Uh, there's no reason to expose those individuals to that scenario and never it's not a void, but never cross a picket line on foot unless uh, there's a specific reason that you're going out to talk to either the picket captain or engage in some conversation there. As I mentioned before, there's, there might be some blocking or obstruction. If you experience that, um, again, remain patient. Try not to display any emotion. Uh, remain stopped until either police or security uh, arrive to assist you or until uh, the blockage is removed. Never force your way through a picket line. Um, even if you think, okay, well, I'm gonna kind of inch my way through this. Um, you don't wanna do that and try to kind of part this, the, uh, the picket line with your vehicle. Uh, you may be accused of either injuring or hitting one of the picketers. And uh, like I said, don't ever attempt to move picketers with your vehicle. Or even if you're sitting still, uh, don't race, race the engine, things of that nature that would create some type of uh, unnecessary engagement with the, the picketers. Um, drive through the picket line only as space is allowed. And when you do that, very carefully and slowly. And as I mentioned, if it's necessary, get police or security there to help direct you through the picket line. If your vehicle's bumped, rocked, hit, or otherwise damaged, stay, stay calm. Don't get out of your vehicle or open your door. Um, security will be there to assist you and help hopefully uh, be able to capture for evidence uh, this misconduct. But the other thing is, even if you do in, uh, incur some damage to a vehicle, Make sure you get through the picket line, you get onto the property, you get to a safe place before either you get out to look at your vehicle or you get out to uh, report the incident. Make sure that you're in a safe haven before you, in fact, exit your vehicle. 
Uh, don't take anything personally during this time as well. Uh, don't take photos of picketers uh, on your own. Uh, don't ever threaten or engage any physical contact. Um, don't get into arguments or discuss with the picketers or members of the bargaining units about the merits of their strike or the progress of negotiation. Uh, don't accept any paper or documents that the, the union might be handing out as well. And uh, don't ever appeal to the picketers or strike employees to return to work or threaten discharge. Uh, leave that up to the negotiations team and your management staff and your management and the leadership of that uh, location to engage and deal with the picketers. Um, if you don't have a, a role in that, um, don't take it upon yourself to, uh, to help either get the sides together or hopefully get them back to work sooner. So you're going to continue to operate. What does that mean? Um, how are you going to go about doing that? So you need to take a look at your replacement or your supplemental workforce and kind of logistics around that. Uh, will you need replacement labor or can you handle or continue to operate with management staff that's on site there? Uh, would those individuals be brought in from other facilities that you have? Or would you need to go to an outside firm to outsource those individuals to bring them in? How many different types of workers would you need? So part of that planning process, especially when you're looking at continuing to operate and uh, being able to um, temporarily fill those striking workers' positions, is do some type of uh, uh, workforce analysis or a, a gap analysis as it relates to the skill sets that you need, pairing uh, internal resources to fill those, uh, those positions. And then once that's done, you're going to see kind of where you have that shortage or weakness as it relates to the skill sets and help determine if you need to go outside your organization to help fill those roles. Uh, when will you begin to operate with a, a replacement workforce? Uh, would that be on day one of a strike, or would you be looking at ramping up into some type or level of uh, production? Uh, you may want to get to and make the decision that you're only going to operate at 50% production uh, no matter how long the strike lasts. Uh, how long will it take you to get there? You may want to say, well, we want to phase in to be at 100%. Uh, you're not going to be at 100% on day one or two. Uh, how are you going to take a strategic approach to get there from week one to week two to week three uh, to get up to that 100% if that's your, uh, your objective? And then when will you need to begin training those workers? Uh, you're going to have individuals who might have the skill sets necessary but may not be work, used to working within your environment, even if they're uh, – resources that you're pulling from within the company. It may have been a number of years before that, since they've done that job or they've worked in that capacity. Uh, they may be from another location that doesn't have the same uh, workflow that you do. Uh, you may need to get them some additional training as it relates to the equipment that they be, may be using and just getting them used to your policies and procedures. Um, make sure you build that in to your, uh, your plan as it relates to where you want to be from a production level. Um, it also helps if you're using an outside service to do that, making sure that you can document those policies and procedures and or training that was done for those individuals uh, because if in fact the union wants to use the tactic of making a phone call to OSHA have them come in and do an inspection because they say that you're not operating in a safe environment, you can easily produce those training logs and or documentation showing that the adequate training has been done. Uh, will the personnel working during the strike require housing on the property from a safety standpoint or just as a result of working longer hours? Generally, it's going to be a 12-hour shift, seven days a week. Uh, do you want to house them on the property? Would they need food service while they're on the property as well? Even if you don't house people on the, on, on the property and 
let's say they're coming in from either local hotels or their homes, you may want to consider looking at having a food service uh, component as well so that they don't have to worry about what are they going to do as far as brown bagging or how are they going to get out and get their lunch and provide that service, at least initially, maybe for the first couple weeks to a month if it's a long event, where they don't have to worry about that. They know they can go to a place, decompress, sit down, talk with their friends or colleagues, forget about what they were, they've were they been doing, get a good meal, and then head back to work. It's a huge morale issue uh, as well. And then what other living conditions or services may be required? Um, sundry items, um, some type of medical response and or um, uh, medical attention uh, if need be or that doesn't require uh, going to a, a hospital or having emergency services called general first aid and uh, safety accommodations. So those are some of the things, and I know that uh, an hour of time, quite honestly, to go through this is not a tremendous amount. Uh, we could have uh, uh, easily spent much more time on each area of those slides, but this was really designed to get, kind of give you an idea of what to think about as you're putting that plan together. We don't have any uh, um, individual who has that experience or you need to reach out to your uh, legal team. A lot of uh, law firms do have some type of contingency planning. If you wanted to reach out to an organization like us, we can come in and help in a number of different ways through that process. So um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. I'm gonna leave this slide up here a little bit longer. There's my contact information, my email address, as well as, well as my direct dial number. Um, we'll be glad to, to provide you with uh, any information there. Don't feel any pressure as it relates to if you contact us, that'll mean uh, nonstop uh, contact from us. And we're really uh, committed to making sure that organizations that we partner with from a business standpoint uh, make the necessary preparations and or have uh, well thought out uh, grounded plans in place to help them get to their end goal. And that end goal might be that it's a position where you need and you can't avoid taking a strike or that you're in a, just in a, a position of strength and you're prepared to, but it helps you get to that uh, uh, new contract and helps in that negotiation process that allows you to get a new agreement with the union. So with that, I appreciate everybody uh, uh, taking time to uh, attend the webinar today. And as I mentioned before, don't ever hesitate to reach out directly to us. We'll be glad to answer any question that we can for you. I appreciate it and everybody have a great day.